Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. And a small but dedicated crowd, so I appreciate that. And uh, this will be is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel and also on the uh, department website on Facebook. So anyway, uh, t this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And uh, Teal College has been trying to do a few things this year uh, to recognize that and commemorate that. And this is a, one of those events. So uh, I'm Dane Clausen. I'm the chair of the Department of Media Communication and Public Relations and the executive director of the James Pettus Communication Center. I also am something of a me media historian. And our topic for tonight is Martin Luther and the growth of the printing and publishing industry. So this is uh, another in a series of, uh, of Pettus Center Presents events. And uh, we've had a couple so far this semester and we'll be having more uh, next semester as always. So anyway, we, for some context, uh, by uh, the early 15th century, what is now Germany, had major independent cities. Nuremberg and Augsburg were the two biggest in southern Germany. Augsburg was a big banking center. And new center, it was on a post road that linked Germany, Italy, and the so-called low countries. Other major cities in, in the German states at that time were Hamburg, Lübeck, Cologne, Strasbourg, and in nearby Switzerland, Basel, of course. So anyway, in the second half of the 15th century, uh, commerce in, in printed books in Flanders and uh, Italy and southern Germany was starting to be beginning to take off. Uh, Gutenberg had perfected his uh, concept of the uh, movable type press uh, about 1454. He showed off his, uh, what we now know as the Gutenberg Bible, uh, at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 1454. And we remember that. We probably don't remember that he also went bankrupt uh, as a result of his uh, investing in, the book, in, the book, in his Bible printing and his publishing uh, company generally. It wasn't terribly successful uh, financially. Um, and he never did a major project any time in the rest of his life. It was not really clear that uh, movable type presses were even necessary. The uh, manuscript book industry was doing extremely well. It was kind of well-oiled, uh, and uh, there was a definite market for that. Uh, and it wasn't exactly clear that the movable type press was going to take off. But, and so it did in sort of fits and starts. Uh, uh, printers around uh, Germany would print 300 to 500 copies. Uh, and, uh, and, and it wasn't any big trouble to, to print this many copies. The, the big problem was where do I sell 300 to 500 copies? They didn't, the printers did not have uh, experience in sales of mass-produced books, if you can call 300 a mass production. The manuscript book trade didn't have that problem. They just made one copy uh, frequently to order, usually to order, and, uh, and, and, and it, you didn't have inventory sitting around. Anyway, the solution by about 1585 was to link together the publishing industry with rich merchants who were already dealing in other goods because why? Well, they knew about raising money, they knew about getting loans, they knew about making loans, they knew about transporting so often heavy goods to other markets. Uh, they could learn quickly about, uh, de about uh, deals to trade one stock of books for another stock of books uh, in another town or another uh, location, some other location. They knew how, where and how to store goods, and not just transport, but store. And uh, many business people also saw a, an interesting and great potential bo uh, st uh, business idea when they saw one. But again, this was in fits and starts. Uh, when you look back at the historical data, uh, between uh, 1455 and 1485, the book publishing industry in Germany actually shrank. Uh, because of so many publishers uh, coming and going uh, out of business, and there was more going out of business than, than coming into business. So anyway, um, the industry was also concentrated. Uh, there was book, were book, books published about 200 uh, European cities, about two-thirds of this in the second half of the 15th, 15th century period. About two-thirds of them were published in only 12 cities. Six of them were in Germany, four in Italy, and two in France. All 12 of those cities had populations of more than 30,000. So we don't think of 30,000 now as being a big city, but back then it was. 
And then uh, uh, fairly soon after that, two other uh, cities joined, the, joined those 12, and those were London and Antwerp. We have uh, pretty good numbers overall about where the industry was by, by 1501, uh, this is, which is sort of considered the end of the early printing period. Uh, there were uh, 282 towns that had had, had had at least one printed book had printed there, and there had been about 30,000 different titles. So this is in less than about 50 years of the invention of the printing press. Anyway, amazingly, uh, about 125,000 copies uh, survive of, of, of books from this period today. Uh, so, I mean, that's not 125,000 different books. There's only uh, 30,000 different books, but 125,000 copies. So, uh, an average of, uh, you know, four apiece, but some there are no uh, copies left. Anyway, so about uh, 3,550 of those have been printed in Venice. Uh, 2,800 in Paris, 2,000 in Rome, about 1,500 in Cologne, 1,400 in Lyons, uh, 1,300 in Leipzig, 1,200 in Augsburg, 1,200 in Strasbourg, about 1,100 in Milan, 1,100 in Nuremberg, and 800 in Florence. So Venice was the big leader. Um, Venice was a very rich uh, uh, place and a uh, very literate kind of place. And Wittenberg, uh, which, of course, plays heavily into the Martin Luther story, is the Martin Luther story, uh, was not even in the top 20 in terms of publishers. We'll, we'll come back to that in due time. So as Andrew Pedigree, um, who recently wrote a book on, a uh, new book on uh, Luther and the early publishing industry, uh, wrote, quote, it was 60 years since Johannes Gutenberg had announced to general applause the success of his experiments printing with movable type, but the long-term consequences of this technological development were still decidedly uncertain. Those who enthusiastically embraced the new medium found it was remarkably difficult to make money producing printed books. Most of the print first printers lost money and many went bankrupt, as I already mentioned. Chastened, the second generation of printers took refuge in conservative subjects. It was by no means clear how or why printing could serve a great movement of change. Printers, in fact, discovered that the most reliable profits lay in servicing the needs of traditional religion. They would need some persuading to abandon that steady, established business. Traditional religion, of course, means the Catholic Church at this point. Wittenberg, Martin Luther's base in Saxony, had no printing press until 1502. And that was only because Wittenberg University was there and only because the ruler, Frederick the Wise, uh, made sure that the town had a press as well as a university. Why didn't Wittenberg have a press before? Well, it was a small town, and books could also be bought in the near nearby towns of Erfurt and Leipzig. And we'll get back to this in a little bit later. So Luther um, uh, had uh, uh, had reached the age, age past uh, the age of 30 and more, uh, was respectable and respected, um, and hadn't published a book, uh, but that would soon change. He um, posted his 95 uh, theses in 1517, as we all know, and within five years, uh, only five within five years, by 1522, he was Europe's most published author, alive or or dead. How did he do this? Well, he was a very fine writer with a bias towards writing short, whereas uh, scholars tended to write long. In fact, they went on and on and on and on and on. Uh, he wrote in uh, German, not Latin. Uh, that was a highly controversial decision, but it was a key part of uh, his philosophy and the success of the Ref Reformation. Uh, of course, this dramatically broadened his audience. We uh, had a, an exhibit in the uh, gallery here at, at Teal this semester that had uh, prints of, uh, of Martin Luther and, and a, a few other subjects up around the room. And the professors who introduced that made the point that the, the, the uh, graphic representations, the portraits of Luther and so on, were necessary when a lot of people were, will, were illiterate uh, because they, they couldn't read a book, whatever language it was in. Uh, but of course, uh, if you were going to reach a literate audience uh, in Germany, uh, you were still a safer bet to go with German rather than Latin. Uh, anyway, so 
Uh, Wittenberg um, was not a player in publishing, as I said earlier, but uh, also Luther decided that it should be. And eventually, Wittenberg became the Briti biggest printing center in Europe. Anyway, uh, sorry, in Germany, rather. Along the, t along the way, Luther spent a great deal of time in print shops uh, giving instructions and criticisms. And if you, some of these, uh, uh, he was uh, kind of a nag. Uh, no, he wasn't kind of a nag. He was totally a nag. Uh, and <laughs> uh, he was basically hovering over the shoulder of, uh, uh, literally, of uh, printers who were uh, typesetting his books and, and, and were scribbling all over page proofs and, and so on. He was extremely de detail-oriented, as well as being very prolific. Uh, Luther um, was also uh, aware of aesthetics. I mean, he sort of knew what an attractive book was from an ugly book. Uh, and uh, he got some help on this from Lucas Cranach, uh, who was, uh, happened to just be there in Witt Wittenberg. Cranach was a, a famous... Uh, uh, artist and a business person, and he became an en engraver and a woodcutter, uh, and um, uh, and so on and so forth. What was he doing in Wittenberg? He was the uh, court painter uh, to Frederick the Wise. So he had, a, as they say these days, a government job, um, and and a steady paycheck from from the uh, local nobility. Um, Cranach. Um, he yeah, was uh, a bold artist, uh, he tried to be a clear artist, and he uh, brought this, se this uh, sensitivity uh, and sensibility to uh, book publishing and advising Luther and uh, uh, various printers. <clears throat> anyway, Luther um, and his friends promoted the Reformation every way they could think of, um, of course, not just with books, but also letter writing, uh, songs, paintings, as we've already said, uh, prints, as we've already said, uh, lectures, uh, sermons, and discussions, and more. So uh, we have to, tonight's talk is, uh, is just about the printing part, but there was a whole lot more to uh, the communication involved in the Reformation. Uh, Wittenberg, uh, despite having the patronage of the uh, local uh, ruler, uh, Frederick the Wise, he was the elector of Saxony, um, uh, had uh, a lot of turnover in printers between 1502 and 1516, uh, just before the 95 Theses. Uh, uh, Wittenberg went through um, five different printers that came and went, came and went, uh, and they uh, published only 123 titles uh, in those 14 years, or if you do the math, only about eight books a year. Not very much, uh, and that was probably why they, why, they, why, they give up, why they gave up and left town. Uh, what, what's the special about the year 1502? It was the first year that there was a press in Wittenberg. It was, had been brought there by, from Erfurt uh, by a university professor, Nicholas Marshalk, and uh, he was one of the ones, one of the short timers. He, was, he only stayed two years. But when he left Wittenberg, he left the press there for the next person uh, to come along and use, and the press was taken over by Herman Trebelius. Uh, who also only published a few books before leaving town. Apparently there was no printer at all in Wittenberg from 1506 to 1507. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was just, they were all just having a really hard go of it. So uh, why was Wittenberg so special in terms of having such problems that late? Well, again, Wittenberg was, just, was still just a small town. Uh, but scholars think it also had something to do with uh, the printers in other towns increasingly being business-minded, whereas the printers who came and went in Wittenberg were essentially amateur business people. They were scholars. Uh, they were uh, trying to become professional printers, but they weren't really very business-minded. So they also weren't very, weren't, weren't very artistic or aesthetic uh, until the influence of Cranach. Uh, when books are looked at from this period from Wittenberg, they were all in the same typeface, all in small typeface. There weren't any big initial capital letters. There weren't fancy title pages. There weren't not illustrations. Uh, there weren't even different types of type for different types of content, like main text and footnotes or, or side notes or something. So the Wittenberg products um, were functional but uh, ugly, um, probably just barely functional. So um, 
why, why was that? Well, again, as I said, they, they weren't particularly aesthetic or, or, uh, or business-minded, uh, but also there wasn't money to invest in, in fancy uh, engravings or title pages or lots of different typefaces and so on. Um, and there was also an ongoing dis a decision that has its pros and cons of not competing with other uh, nearby printers in other towns. Like, what can Wittenberg do that no one else is doing? And the answer was not much. Anyway, the upside was that press expenses in Wittenberg were low, um, and the biggest expense for a long time was, was actually paying Lucas Cranach to supply uh, illustrations when that eventually started happening. Um, the longtime printer, uh, uh, Rao Grunenberg, arrived in Wittenberg in 1508, um, and he, was, he ended up staying a long time. So there was some stability. We'll talk more about him in a minute. And Luther arrived in 1511. So it was a nice little coincidence that this printer that was going to stay a long time uh, arrived only, uh, only a couple years before uh, Luther, of course, who also stayed in Wittenberg a long time. In 1513, uh, however, the, the university print shop printed only t 10 books, uh, all in Latin, and all for professors and students at the university. The books were simply texts of speeches or, or lectures, textbooks, and so on. So pretty much just for consumption at the university. Luther would change all, all, of, all of that, uh, obviously. So, so who was Rao Grunenberg? Uh, well, it was uh, Johann Rao hyphen Grunenberg. Um, he was uh, reliable, he was dependable, he was loyal, um, he was persistent, uh, all of those things. Uh, he and Luther became uh, friends uh, for, uh, over, for a long time, although um, Luther became increasingly frustrated with, with Rao Grunberg, Grunberg, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and uh, Luther realized almost immediately that that Rao Grunenberg was a slow worker. And for a guy like Luther, who was just cranking out one thing after another after another, uh, being, being slow was uh, a big disadvantage uh, for, for Luther. So um, Lu Luther um, uh, was you know, starting to do some writing and uh, encouraging his friends to do some writing and also uh, uh, you know, encouraging some things other than textbooks and lectures being printed, and Rao Grunenberg actually was um, had more work than more, much more work than he could handle, uh, even by 1513, four years before the 95 Theses. So, anyway, flash forward, um, Wittenberg just come, totally took off after 1517. Uh, between 1517 and Luther's death in 1546. Rao Grunenberg and usually three or four other printer publishers in town uh, together uh, published 2,721 different titles. If you do the math, that's an average of 91 books per year uh, coming out of just four or five print shops. Uh, astonishing, actually, in, 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 until you know that when we talk about titles back then, some of these were just an eight-page pamphlet. It wasn't like it wasn't like you know these book these 2,721 books were all 100 or 200 pages long. If just for the record, let's remember. I'm sure you all know this, but let's remember that the uh, the typesetting was done by hand, uh, literally letter by letter by letter, um, uh, upside down and back. Well, not not upside down, but backwards. Uh, because the type had to be inked and then a piece of paper put on it and then pulled back off and, and the type had to read the right direction, right? So uh, typesetting was done completely by hand um, until the late 19th century when the linotype was invented um, in Germany and spread quickly in the U.S. So even printing eight pages was a big pain in the neck, but um, just imagine uh, what... Um, Gutenberg had, it went through to print the uh, print the Bible, for example. So, anyway, the the 2,721 titles figure meant about three million copies uh, came out of Wittenberg uh, uh, during that uh, sl slightly less than 30-year period. Uh, you do the math; that's also astonishing. Um, 
an average of about 1,100 copies per book. Uh, roughly half were in German, half were Latin, even uh, late in the period, even at Luther's death. Uh, and since Little Wittenberg did not need uh, half its books in Latin, nor did it need 1,100 copies per book, uh, obviously a lot of those were being um, exported to other towns and even other countries. Right? Wittenberg could, by itself couldn't, couldn't absorb all those, all those books. Anyway, um, during that period, uh, the general estimate is that about one-third of the books were written by Luther, uh, which is also just astonishing. I mean, like 900 books or whatever just by Luther alone. Uh, and about another 20% were by his closest colleagues and, and followers. So um, they were just like a publishing and printing machine there in, there in Wittenberg. Anyway, Luther was uh, seriously beginning to publish his writings in 1516, just the year before the 95 Theses. And he had enough, but he had, had enough experience with Rao Grunenberg by that point um, that um, he had very mixed feelings about having the local guy publish uh, his book. So, uh, but Rao Grunenberg had been very loyal to Luther, and Luther also felt indebted uh, likewise. But Luther realized that Rao Grunenberg at that point had been a professional printer publisher for eight years and hadn't really improved very much, he hadn't really learned very much, um, that he wasn't even paying attention to what other printers and publishers were doing in other towns in terms of uh, new design, new, new typography, and so on and so forth. And so um, while Luther continued to uh, contract work with Rao Grunenberg, he also started working with uh, publishers in, in, in other towns, oh, just oh, pretty much right off the bat. Uh, the first place that Luther went was Landsberg, uh, which was about 50 miles away. So um, imagine at, at this point, you know, um, having to get a book manuscript um, on horseback, um, you know, to, to a printer 50 miles away. And then you, you'd want to see page proofs, and that, that was 50 miles away. And then when the print job was done, you'd want to get the books from Landsberg back to Wittenberg, which is also 50 miles away, st still 50 miles away. Um, and 50 miles, of course, was a lot worse then than it is now. Um, anyway, uh, Frederick the Wise, uh, the elector of Saxony, um, was uh, uh, becoming more and more interested in books, too. In addition to wanting to make sure, in addition to just wanting to make sure there was a university and press in his town, and uh, he started spending a lot of money on buying books, and he would li literally try to order the the most beautiful, the most uh, interesting, the most famous, uh, the most uh, praised books from around Europe. And by 1512, he had such a collection that he simply donated it to the to the to the university library uh, as sort of a legacy. Uh, anyway, while Luther was doing his writing and um, his thinking and his lecturing and so on and so forth, uh, Luther's friends, uh, he had a close, close group of several friends, um, they were making sure that his books got printed in uh, Nuremberg, Leipzig, and Basel right, to le much larger audiences. It was, and, and, and uh, I mean, these were printings in these other, uh, other towns, not just selling the books to these towns. So anyway, it was the Basel printing uh, that Erasmus uh, sent to Sir Thomas More in England of the 95 Theses, uh, which was, you know, this was the sort of introduction of Protestantism into England in some ways. Anyway, in March 1518, uh, Luther wrote and published his Sermon on Indulgence and Grace, uh, it was another list of propositions like the 95 Theses, included things such as uh, people cannot take action that will satisfy for their sins, indulgences help tolerate imperfections and don't help anyone, and it is better to do good works than to give a building to the church. So he was, he was, uh, he was this was a year after the 95 Theses, and he was obviously still just... Uh, 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 continuously and um, multifaceted, multifaceted ways and systematically attacking the Catholic Church. 
Pedigree, um, the author I mentioned a little while ago, wrote the recent book on Lutheran publishing, said, quote, it was an instant publishing sensation. Rao Grunenberg published possibly two or possibly three editions. By the end of the year, it had been reprinted in Leipzig four times, twice, in, twice each in Nuremberg, Augsburg, and Basel. This set a pattern with, that would be followed for almost all of Luther's vernacular works for the following years of controversy. An instant, insistent demand for the Wittenberg originals, followed by immediate republication in the major citadels of German print. In this way, Luther swiftly made his way into the homes of thousands of his fellow, fellow citizens who had probably never before owned the work of a living German author. Now, there's an interesting point, the, a living German author. The decision to address a wider public had been Luther's own, but it was print that had made him, that made him a national figure. The sermon on indulgence and grace alerted the German printing industry to Luther's potential value. In other words, Luther started looking like a cash cow uh, to the printers and publishers. Anyway, Luther was, um, again, as I said a while ago, also aware of the aesthetics of all this. Um, the 95 theses were, uh, were you know, printed, reprinted many, many times. They were generally grouped together into 20 short paragraphs. Um, each one only four or five sentences. This was more attractive to look at and seemed like more digestible to read, um, and it seems to have worked really well. Um, the entire uh, work was only 1,500 words long and fit into an eight-page pamphlet. So uh, um, Luther, again, was thinking short, um, thinking about how to keep the cost down, um, how to, keep the con how to um, attract the masses, uh, how to, you know, keep the work focused and so on. Anyway, uh, in, by 1519, Luther was uh, just writing uh, just tons and tons of, of short essays on all kinds of subjects that he thought would interest average Christians. The Lord's Prayer or about the body of Christ, for example. They sold well and were quickly reprinted in numerous editions. He also rewrote his 15 to 16, 15, 16 to 15, 17 lecture series on Galatians and gave the manuscript in May to uh, the Leipzig printer Melchior Lauder, whose name we'll come across again. In 1518, 1519, Luther became Europe's most published author. I mean, he went from being incredibly, uh, you know, very obscure in 1517 to being the best-selling author in all of Europe in two years. In those two years, how did he do that? Luther released 45 separate writings in those two years, 25 in Latin and 20 in German. They were published, as, published in 291 editions by various different printers, and, the, all, and a lot of his writings were uh, also uh, resulted in endless sort of rebuttals, and then he would rebut the rebuttal and so on and so forth, so that there was just uh, the, the publishing and printing industry became something of an, in, uh, an ongoing conversation uh, between uh, Luther and his supporters and their opponents. How did the printing industry ca keep up with that? Well, um, the, the printing, even though Wittenberg was struggling, the rest of the printing industry in Germany was doing pretty well by 1516. Uh, they had produced uh, 1,100 different titles in, 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 uh, just one, in just two years around Germany, and this put Germany way ahead of, 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 of even, even France or Italy in terms of total output. So we see Germany becoming a very literate um, uh, culture with a rich, uh, with a rich uh, reading and printing uh, history. Uh, Germany's printing industry was also spread out between a number of different cities, uh, which also helped, whereas in France it was pretty much just Paris, uh, and in Italy it was pretty much just Venice. So, anyway, when Luther released a writing, uh, it could typically be printed by Rao Grunenberg in Wittenberg, then quickly reprinted in Leipzig, and then reprinted again in Nuremberg, Augsburg, and Basel, and it was, it was, then it was, the, the horses were out of the barn by that point. Um, <clears throat> Of his 45 writings in those years, 21 of them were eight pages or less. So this guy's not putting out thousand-page books, but um, he's printing out a lot of different things on a lot of different subjects. Luther was a particular boon for Augsburg, which had no university. 
Um, only 37 books were published there in 1517, but this increased to 89 in the next year in 1518 and 117 in 1589. Luther wrote 41 of them. Basel took the lead in reprinting uh, Luther's works in Latin um, and uh, also putting together an, an anthologies of uh, his writings where these collected eight-page pamphlets together in a, a book with six or eight or ten of them in one volume. Anyway, so um, what about the keeping the printer supplied? Well, um, fortunately, printing presses were pretty simple mechanisms. Um, they were until um, the, actually the 19th century when big steam-powered pr presses were invented to, for Metro dailies. But you know, in, in a place like, say, uh, Greenville, uh, the pr printing press would have been just a hand-operated, two sheets at a time kind of operation until probably the 1880s, when probably a linotype got to a place like Greenville, or maybe the 1890s. Anyway, but uh, there was other things printers need. Uh, fortunately, Germany has lots of trees so, uh, and, and a population for rags, so uh, paper was not such a big deal. Uh, Lucas Cranach, uh, Luther's friend there in Wittenberg, made sure, that, uh, he, uh, made sure he added his own supply by buying a paper mill, um, which, by the way, um, newspaper publishers did in, the, did in the United States again the first half of the 20th century to make sure they have a steady supply of paper. The other, uh, other thing they needed, of course, was type, um, the, the made out of metal, uh, but Germany had Europe's most advanced metallurgy industry as well, so not such a big problem. Anyway, um, so why well, we said about how Luther was sending work um, work uh, out of town fairly early on. Well, by 1518, uh, Luther had sort of had it with Raoul uh, Grunenberg's slowness and limited capacity, uh, and he decided to bring um, a printer he'd done business with out of town uh, with Melchior Lauder from from Leipzig to Wittenberg, despite Lauder still being a good Catholic. Lauder had been in the printing business since 1495, had done a great job on about 500 uh, different titles. Um, and Lauder was like, ah, I don't think I want to move to Wittenberg. So he sent his son. And uh, then Luther had a, a very long working relationship uh, with, um, with uh, Lauder's son. Anyway, by 1522, um, Luther had long, had long been ex excommunicated by the Catholic Church. Uh, he had uh, legions of opponents, and maybe not that long, but anyway, had legions of opponents and enemies that severely limited his travel, but had published 160 writings, about one-third of them in Latin. So um, Luther was, uh, you know, letting his, his works, his writings speak for him. He was, it was dangerous for him to travel very much. It was impossible for him to travel to cer certain places. And so it was great that, that Luther was such a gr uh, great writer and was, had such a great uh, working relationship with printers and publishers because um, he wasn't going to be uh, able to travel around, uh, around the country freely and, and speak everywhere he would have liked to have spoken. Anyway, when Lauder's son showed up in... Uh, in Wittenberg, uh, it was kind of a revolution. Uh, Lauder started using big artistic capital letters uh, uh, to break up the type. Uh, to they started being more obvious page breaks. There was a different type for main text versus side notes and, and references and so on. And also he started using uh, decorative woodcuts uh, to illustrate books. So. Um, this was big progress, but the bigger progress was when Lucas Cranach, the local businessman and artist, said, well, I, I can do that, and he started also producing a lot of, of uh, illustrations for the books. Cranach had studied Albrecht Durer, Durer's work um, extensively. You can tell by looking at their work the similarities. Uh, coincidentally, I was just at the Albrecht Durer exhibit at the Cincinnati Art Museum just a, f a couple weeks ago, and it was uh, fantastic. And uh, you can, uh, by looking at Durer, you can also see the Kran where Cranach got his influence uh, the other way around as well. Anyway. Um,
Cranach, as I said earlier, had a good deal. He had a government job, uh, steady, uh, steady work uh, and uh, steady pay. And, uh, but he also was given flexibility of doing outside work, uh, which was allowed, what allowed him to do the illustrations for, uh, for Lauder's press and for Luther's work, among others. He, uh, he was well fixed. He had an apartment in the castle. He had a horse. And uh, uh, he also was uh, free to hire people to work under him as well. So Cranach's uh, uh, operation together with Lauder's operation uh, became together uh, quite big. Um, and, and they were able to do that without much, um, uh, without much limitation from anyone or anything. Uh, Luther and Cranach uh, became uh, g close friends, uh, not just working partners, but uh, uh, close friends, although Cranach continued to do work for Catholics, ca key Catholics as well. Um, but uh, Cranach's, one of his major contributions to the Reformation was not just doing engravings for Luther, but doing engravings of Luther. Um, and there were uh, three, uh, three in a row within the first few years of their uh, working relationship. Um, Durer had pointed out that there was no good portrait of Luther um, floating around, and Cranach decided to fix that. So uh, what does Luther look like uh, in, uh, in, in these uh, Cranach engravings? Well, um, in one he looks, as uh, people say, simple, uh, lean, uh, but also resolute and practically monumental. I mean, like a statue uh, in ink. Uh, in the second one, he was dressed as a monk, his hand across his heart to show friendship and sincerity, and the other hand on an open book. The third one is perhaps was probably the most famous one. This was the one as Luther as Junker Jorg. Uh, you know, hiding out as a, as a uh, uh, dressed like a knight, a German knight with a full beard uh, and wearing simple black clothes. And this was a very striking uh, figure that was, became the most famous of the three. Um, Cranach, uh, Lauder's son, and Cranach's business partner, uh, Christian Doring, uh, were all working together in business by late 1519. Cranach had space in his buildings for Lauder's printing work. As I said, Cranach owned a paper mill. Cranach had capital, and he also had essentially a monopoly on illustration. So this was an extremely uh, symbiotic and productive relationship. Uh, so um, Cranach, um, one of his earlier groups of illustrations was, uh, you know, just uh, main biblical scenes, the blinding of Saul, Samson and the lion, David and Goliath, uh, Moses and old law juxtaposed with the emergence of Jesus and new law. Um, they appeared, uh, as people s sort of say, uh, magnificent and important. Um, and uh, you, can, you can find them in books and on websites and so on. They're, they are gorgeous. And Wittenberg's books, because of this, went from being essentially the ugliest in Germany to the most beautiful in Germany. Cranach's designs were uh, copied widely in Augsburg and Nuremberg and elsewhere, and uh, Cranach was aware of this, but there, and, and he, was he was in some ways flattered, in other ways he, uh, he was sort of resigned, uh, annoyed that he couldn't do anything about it uh, because this was before copyright law, and he had essentially no recourse. Starting in 1520, uh, with uh, Cranach's urging and Durer's urging, Luther's portrait started being used widely in his books. Um, and Luther became, you might say, a modern celebrity. His name, his likeness, his viewpoints, and his writing style uh, became increasingly well known uh, to the masses. Uh, Authors' names were not often highlighted in, in, on title pages. They were just sort of mixed in with some other, te in the middle of a sentence of, you know, published by, written by so-and-so who's of such and such and whatever, right? And uh, Luther's name was one of the first authors who was like, whose name was put in big type on a separate line, like, hey, it's Martin Luther. Uh, and uh, his name wasn't even consistently presented. Uh, in some books, it was Mart period Luther's with an S on the end. Other, book had, other books had Martin Luther. Other books had Doct, as in Dr. Martin Luther. But everybody, there was only one Martin Luther, however you spelled it. 
Um, Luther was um, aware of the fact that he was becoming something that hadn't really been seen before, a, a national and international celebrity. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, he, um, uh, in, in 1521, as he was waiting to uh, be called to the Diet of Worms, um, he sent a letter to uh, Georg Sp Sp Spalatin, uh, Frederick the Wise's secretary, and included an autographed uh, copy of one of Cranach's portraits of him, thus uh, predating movie stars by about 400, 400 years. Uh, he started getting asked over and over again to write uh, endorsements or testimonials, what you might call, also prefaces for other people's books. Uh, and he, got in, and, uh, he uh, wrote about 90 of these in, during his lifetime. Uh, f f fairly early in his period of writing prefaces, he, he quipped, I must now be a professional writer of prefaces. He started getting overwhelmed with letters coming in, everybody wanted his opinion or his advice or, or help or something, and he started delegating letter writing to um, his close friends and, and, and associates. Um, and, uh, and, and he was kind of got dismissive of uh, sometimes of, how, of uh, who was writing him or what they wanted or how many letters he was getting. Uh, he, he wrote, he said to one of his best friends one, one day, I shall not answer Mr. Emser. Anyone who seems fitting to you may answer, perhaps Emsdorf, if he is not too good for dealing with this kind of dung. Um, <clears throat> a major marketing opportunity for um, Luther's books and the whole of the Protestant Reformation generally was the Frankfurt Book Fair. Uh, they, they rolled out a lot of key new books there. It was held twice a year, once at around Easter and this other time in, in September. Uh, and uh, this also helped um, s uh, spread uh, the, the word um, much more widely be beyond just the reprints in Al Augsburg and Nuremberg and, and Basel and, uh, and so on. Anyway, um, 443 editions of the entire, entire or part of the Bible were printed in Ur Germany between 1522 and Luther's death in 1546. Um, so the printers were starting to publish uh, not just eight-page pamphlets, but uh, the entire Old Testament, or excuse me, the entire New Testament or whatever. They were published in High German and also Low German um, and, uh, and, 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 and Latin as well, although uh, increasingly, um, increasingly only in German. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, High German was basically Northern German and Low German was S Southern German. I don't know why they just can't call it Northern German and Southern German. But there's this old, old terms, High German and Low German, um, which isn't about anything L about elevation or class or anything else. Anyway, uh, the Bi printing the Bible wasn't a huge major major undertaking. Uh, the uh, you know the it wasn't uncommon for the Old Testament to be uh, printed and sold in three separate parts, uh, and that tells you you know people would buy one third of the Old Testament and then save up some money and wait for the second part to become available. Um, and you know uh, considering the size of that work, uh, not uh, surprising. Anyway. Um, the uh, um, uh, yeah, and this you know this was kind of frustrating to Luther. Um, Luther, uh, th you know, thought that uh, getting a complete Bible out in German was really one of the highest priorities um, of the Reformation, and but it was not not uh, quick or or easy to do. Anyway. Um, between 1520 and 1525, uh, a, new, a new form emerged in which, and that was uh, satirical commentaries um, on uh, Catholic, the Catholic Church or Catholic beliefs and, or so on and so forth. And I don't have a German example of that, but I have a, a British example of that from, from some time later. Uh, this is an actual copy of a, a British uh, publication from 1679. And uh, the, the, even the title of it is satirical. This is, this is an anti-Catholic uh, publication, obviously, when Protestantism had, had, uh, has, was uh, close to um, becoming uh, dominant in the UK. The publication is called The Weekly Packet of Advice from Rome, or The History of Popery. 
and that's the name of the publication, right? So it's making it's uh, uh, you know making fun of the of the of this idea that you know the Catholics were just sort of sat around uh, all over the world waiting to hear what the what the Pope had, was saying, and then they would just take the orders from from Rome. Anyway, um, I'm the I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure the Germans had something similar, and and much earlier uh, than this uh, weekly packet of advice from Rome from from London. Anyway. Um, Printing quantities continued to, to explode. Um, a standard printing uh, was 300 copies to 700 copies for a, a small pamphlet uh, by, the, by 1525. And uh, by this period, by this time, uh, some printers were really going out on a limb and, and printing as many three, as 3,000 copies of later books. Um, the, we know that um, the total number of, of, of Reformation-related titles printed between 1520 and 1525 may have been as many as four million copies of various uh, titles. So Luther was a dominant. Uh, he was at the height of his uh, uh, personal uh, productivity then. Uh, there were at least uh, 10 times as many books by him as by any other author. Uh, and Luther's books were 30 times more popular than the most popular Catholic author. Uh, if the government, if local governments are still loyal to Catholic Church, uh, cracked down on Protestant publications, which they sometimes did, the risk was, uh, risk was usually pretty high for book sellers, but pretty low for printers, uh, because um, book sellers um, basically published whatever, I mean, sold whatever would sell. They weren't very careful about what they sold, and, and they were pretty open about what they were selling. Uh, printers were more sort of circumspect uh, about, they, sometimes they would hide what they were printing or they'd contract it out to s someone else in another town or something like that. Wittenberg's printing uh, industry, as I said earlier, uh, also grew dramatically during this period from one printer to five. Um, and um, they, they, these were long timers. Uh, one of them, uh, Hans Luft, uh, arrived uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Wittenberg about 1520 and ended up uh, uh, continuing to work until he died at the age of 89 and 1584. So good for him. Anyway, in the last 15 years of his life, Luther um, uh, that is 1531 to 1546. You know, Luther had, 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 was so famous, uh, so uh, powerful in certain ways that he had, he had an enormous amount of control over his own writings. Again, even before copyright law existed, people were, uh, printers were increasingly afraid of doing something that he would disapprove of. Uh, they, they were, um, you know, uh, begging him for work, but they, and, they were all, and they didn't want to offend him, and so on and so forth. And um, this, um, you know, Luther appreciated the fact that, that he wasn't uh, being um, um, used and abused perhaps as much as maybe Cranach was. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, he was concerned himself about being a censor of sorts. I mean, he, he didn't want to, he didn't want to be in a position of basically micromanaging um, what was being printed and published all, published all over Germany. In fact, he, he thought, that kind of sort of micromanagement of communication was antithetical to the Reformation. By 1539, um, you know, seven years before his death, Luther was not writing very much anymore, um, but he was still, you know, putting out some pieces. And um, Wittenberg's uh, printers were um, were 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 so. Um, um, aware of the fact that he was a cash cow for them, that they went to him and made an offer. They would offer him an income of 400 gilden per year if he would guarantee them first crack uh, at his writings. The irony was that he was off giving them first crack on his writings pretty much regularly anyway. Um, now, that, now that Wittenberg had five printers instead of only one, uh, the local capacity was not uh, an issue anymore. Um, this was a, a triple uh, Luther's income at the time, uh, and he said no. He said, I, I don't write and publish to, uh, to make money, and I certainly didn't, um, uh, you know, uh, at, uh, attack and, uh, the Catholic Church and break away from the church and start this great movement to, to make money. 
Anyway, uh, as we know, Luther died in 1546, and um, the rest is literally history, right? Um, Melchior Lauder's brother, Michael, um, uh, was, uh, was publishing um, about uh, over 100 titles per year in nearby, nearby Madgeburg. Uh, Jena replaced Wittenberg as the seat of the Elector of Saxony, uh, and Jena just took off. About 2,000 different titles were uh, printed there between 1553 and 1600. And, you know, who's ever heard of, of Jenna, right? Um, in 1563, you know, by that was 17 years after Luther's death, uh, Wittenberg published uh, 165 books that year. And uh, by the late end of the 16th century, uh, about uh, an average of about 200 per year. At that point, Wittenberg's publishing industry was, was the biggest in Germany, bigger than Nuremberg's, bigger than Augsburg's, bigger than Strasbourg's, and bigger than, than Cologne's. Um, also shortly after Luther died, a new figure emerged in the printing and publishing industry in Germany, and that was the figure of a publisher. Uh, and uh, printers were kind of publishers by default, but in the 1860s, publishers became a separate profession, a separate job. Printers were simply doing printing, and publishers were investing money in printing companies. They were starting printing companies. They were, um, you know, they were uh, holding stock in printing companies, making loans to printing companies, and then marketing the resulting books. Publishers did not run pre presses themselves. Well, guess what? That's the, the, the mo business model of the current publishing industry in the United States is the publishing company does, does n you know, no publishing company owns its own press anymore. That wasn't, that wasn't always true in the United States, but that's certainly, certainly, been, is certainly true now. Anyway, with this kind of backdrop, it should be no surprise that the modern newspaper can be traced to Germany in 1609. Uh, there were sort of kind of newspaper-like things in, uh, earlier than that in both England and the Netherlands, but in terms of a, of a weekly, regularly published and printed publication focusing on you know, government and business and religion news and so on, uh, we basically say, well, that was Germany in 1609. And the modern magazine also was uh, launched in Germany in 1663. As Pedigree, uh, again, our uh, author of this recent book on printing and publishing, and Luther says, printing was essential to the creation of Martin Luther, but Luther was also a determining, shaping force in the German pr printing industry. Many things conspired to ensure Luther's unlikely survival through the first years of the Refor Reformation, but one of them was undoubtedly print. Books circulating with uncontrollable rapidity through the German towns, created at least the appearance of a new consensus that the settled will of the German people was that Luther should be heard. This intimidated and sometimes silenced opponents and fortified Luther's far from numerous supporters in the German estates. But Luther could not have been a force in the German church without his instinctive towering talent as a writer. This was his most astonishing gift to the Reformation and to the German print industry. After Luther, print and public communication would never be the same again. It was an extraordinary legacy for an extraordinary man. Thank you. <laughs>